All right, so welcome everyone to our Rivers to Oceans Week celebration and webinar with Kaylee from Canadian Wildlife Federation. We'd like to thank all of you for spending your afternoon with us learning about this amazing resource that Canada is so blessed to have so much of and different ways that we're going to be able to get out this summer and explore our watershed. So just as a quick overview of what's going to happen today, we're going to do some introductions. Kaylee's going to present. We're going to talk about a number of different resources that both Canadian Wildlife Federation and Watersheds Canada have available to you to engage your families and go outside and explore this summer. And then I'll also announce the upcoming webinar in our Freshwater Stewardship Community Series. And then we'll have some time at the end for any questions or answers. Uh, sorry, questions and answers. So the two people with you today, uh, Kaylee is going to be presenting. She is from the Canadian Wildlife Federation and her email is up on the screen. If you have any questions about resources she shares today, or you'd like to learn more about some of the programs, please feel free to reach out to her. And if you have any questions for Watersheds Canada's programming, my name is Monica, and I will be also helping with any tech problems, Q&A, so you can always shoot me a private message in the Zoom chat and I can help you with that. So just a quick introduction. I know some of you have been to a couple of our previous webinars, which has been really wonderful. Um, it's actually been amazing to see the growth of this community over the past six months. So our freshwater stewardship community was launched this January in response to COVID and just trying to find a way to connect with everyone until we can see you in person again. We already have over 900 members across seven countries and this includes individual students and community groups. If you've missed any of our past webinars or the education resources, they're all archived on our website, which is watersheds.ca slash freshwater hyphen stewardship. And we have different resources from a number of nonprofit organizations like the Canadian Wildlife Federation, Birds Canada, and Water Rangers. So I encourage you to check all of those out. And we would like to thank the SM Blair Family Foundation for funding this stewardship community. So just a quick introduction to Watersheds Canada. Uh, we are a national nonprofit and charitable organization based in Perth, Ontario, which is about an hour from Ottawa. Our main focus is really engaging and empowering shoreline property owners, community groups, and students to take local action for their lakes, rivers, and shorelines. So on the screen, I have our Natural Edge program. This is a shoreline renaturalization program using native plants, which is actually in a number of provinces, including British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and New Brunswick. We also have our Love Your Lake program, which is actually delivered in partnership with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And this is a stewardship and education program for waterfront property owners who are just looking for more information about what's going on on their lake and how they can take individual action to protect their shoreline property, but also the overall lake health. And if you are interested in learning more about either of those programs, uh, the websites are on the screen. We also have a fish habitat uh, restoration program and a number of free resources on our website, including plant guides, a native plant database, and a freshwater toolkit. So all of those are accessible to you and we'll be talking about those more at the end as well, but just to keep it in the back of your mind. So we're very excited to have Kaylee present today and, and kind of take us on this fun journey that she's prepared for us about kind of watersheds. What are they and how we can get involved with them with our family. So just a bit of background about Kaylee. She is based out of Calgary and she is the Canadian Wildlife Federation's Experiential Education Manager. This is a role that focuses on connecting Canadians to nature through hands-on experience, which will be uh, evident as we go through this presentation. Kaylee has over 10 years of experience doing community engagement and environmental education, and she has a passion for connecting people with nature and finding new ways to inspire, inform, and engage them. So I will pass it off to Kaylee. Perfect. Thank you so much, Monica. I, it's such a, a pleasure to be here. I was saying to her before we started that this is the part that I love about my job is connecting with people and talking about ways to engage families and kids with nature. So thank you all for being here. 
Uh, I'm going to get started by sharing my screen and then Monica, let me know. Can you see my slides? Yes, you're good to go. Perfect. Well, before we get started, yes, my name is Kaylee Sutter. I work for the Canadian Wildlife Federation in experiential education. And I particularly work with programs that are focused on families with young kids. So as we go through our presentation today, it's going to be a little bit of a mix. And I hope you're willing to come on a bit of a journey with me because I'm going to talk about potential activities you can take home to do with young kids, um, both at home, in schools, in communities. But we're also going to do a bit of an education today and some activities just so you can get an idea about how to talk about watersheds because it is kind of this big concept uh, and making it tangible for, for people is really key. So as we go through, there might be points where I ask you some questions. Feel free to chime in using the chat and even share your own ideas as we go along because I think that would be great to hear from you as well. So with that, our topic today is really watershed explorers, you know, family friendly activities that um, can help you explore your watershed. So first I thought we should start by saying what is a watershed? Uh, basically a watershed is an area where rainfall collects and drains into a common body of water. So, you know, when the rain falls, it all kind of collects in a river or a lake or a stream and all flows out the same way, eventually reaching the ocean. And when we think about watersheds, they're really kind of this basin idea, they're collection points. And in between different watersheds, you get these, you know, um, high points like mountain ranges or hills. And so, you know, if it's on one side of the hill, it might drain down into one uh, watershed, whereas if it rains on the other side, it might drain down into another. So something to think about when we talk about watersheds is it's thinking about where water goes when it falls, where does it go, and following that flow. And, you know, we think about watersheds, so we, I'm in the Bow River watershed because everything near me flows into the Bow River. But I think we also, it's helpful to zoom out and think, okay, where does it ultimately end up? And that's where we talk about drainage basins as well. So drainage basins can contain multiple watersheds. Um, I myself, I'm, I'm in Calgary, I'm in the Bow River watershed, but that river shed is part of the drainage basin that flows into the Hudson Bay. So that you can see here, these are some of the major drainage basins in Canada. We have the Arctic uh, drainage basin, the Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico is a very small little piece in southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, which actually goes down through the states. There's the Pacific drainage basin, and then there are some places where uh, it doesn't actually drain. It's kind of, they call them internal drainage basins, and that's where the water just collects in lakes and uh, will get evaporated or absorbed, but doesn't actually drain out. So there are a couple places in the prairies where, where they have internal drainage. So I guess my first question for you is looking at this map, what drainage basin do you live in? I'm curious to see where we have uh, people from across the country, if maybe your drainage basin buddies or if we have uh, a wide diversity. So as, as we go through, if you wanna just take a quick look at the map and share in the chat which drainage basin you're in or if you know your watershed too, feel free to plug that in so we know where you're coming to us from today. As I mentioned, mine's Hudson Bay, so it's, it's interesting to imagine all of the watersheds collecting the rivers as they go down into the Hudson Bay. So, again, the topic of today's session is becoming a watershed explorer. So I hope you're all ready to become watershed explorers. I think the best way to explore watersheds and make it really a tangible concept is to just follow the path of the water cycle. So that's what we're going to do today. Together we're going to travel through our watershed and along the way we're going to explore some family friendly activities that you can do um, you know, within your watershed. When you go out to explore, you know, having those ideas handy, that's really great. If you're working with young kids or you have families, hopefully this will prompt some uh, ideas for you or give you some inspiration. And I see some people have put in the chat. We've got people in the Pacific, uh, Atlantic, Hudson Bay. So yeah, we've got a few different uh, places across the country, which is great. So we'll keep it general. But yeah, think about how you could apply this in your watershed as we go through. 
So as I mentioned, uh, we're going to follow the flow of water. So come on this journey with me. I want you to imagine that you are a drop of water, just like our, our little guy here. Uh, you're a drop of water. So let's start by getting into the water cycle. And hopefully all of you know a bit about it, but we're gonna do a bit of review here. And uh, if you're a game, if you can follow along with me, I'm gonna do some hand actions as well. So the water cycle really is kind of a driver behind our watersheds. And we think about water and the flow because the water that's on our planet has been here for thousands and thousands of years. It just gets recycled. So a fun way to talk about water with kids, and even I think it's quite fun, is to think, you know, the water that we have was um, drunk by dinosaurs, right? It's been on the planet. It's just getting recirculated through the water cycle. So when you think about the water cycle, let's start maybe with condensation. So this is my hand action. Feel free to do it along if you like, but condensation. So water cools and condenses in clouds. And then when it, the water gets heavy, then you start to get precipitation, right? So that's rain and snow and hail, all of those things, all of that precipitation comes down and it hits the water surface and then you get runoff. So it goes down the hills, across the water. Some of it gets absorbed as groundwater and actually flows under the ground, but you get that surface runoff and it goes from streams to rivers to the ocean. And then in these bodies of water, the sun will evaporate it and it goes back into the sky where you start that cycle again. So condensation, precipitation, runoff and evaporation. So just a fun way if you're teaching kids about it to get those hand actions involved, to kind of connect the dots rather than just looking at a picture or hearing about it to, you know, be active. But also for us too, you know, we often sit and we don't get as active. So I hope you were following along with me, but that's what we're gonna go do today. We're gonna follow the water cycle and talk about activities along the way. So with that, we're going to start with rain, precipitation, which again can be snow and hail, but it's sort of coming up to summer here. So let's think about rain. What I wanna do is I'm gonna read a guided imagery. And so I want you to close your eyes. Sit still, put down anything you have in your hands, close your eyes and just listen to this story. And then if you like after, we'd love you to share any images and feelings that come to mind, but this can help us set the stage a bit. So close your eyes. It's a late summer's night. There is coolness in the air. You hear the sounds of summer. Somehow you can feel some changes coming in the weather. In the distance, the dark sky is broken by bright flashes of lightning. The light is far away. After a long wait, a rolling rumble is heard. The lightning gets closer. The rumbles are louder. Suddenly the lightning flashes and lights up the whole sky. You need to find shelter to find a safe place. The brilliant flashes of lightning pop and crackle all around you. The noise of thunder is crashing so that the earth seems to shake. There are no longer times of quiet between the rumbles of thunder and flashes of lightning. It becomes still. You notice scents in the air, things you can smell and feel. You begin to hear a new sound. You are not sure what it is. You again have to find shelter. If you had come out thinking the storm was gone, uh, you need to find a place to stay dry. And suddenly the rain is pouring down with a loud, rich sound. It rains and rains and rains, and then stillness. The storm has passed. So that was a guided imagery. Uh, feel free to share any thoughts that you had or feelings or images that came to mind as you open your eyes. Um, that's something that's really wonderful to do with kids uh, because it helps them to focus. You know, if we close our eyes, we can think about things and think about our images. And then you can ask kids what they feel or what they thought or what they imagined. You can draw pictures. And even me as an adult, I've done some of these. Uh, we have a lot of time on Zoom these days. If you're stuck indoors, like taking a minute to close your eyes and do a bit of a guided um, imagery is wonderful because you almost get some of the benefits of being in nature by imagining these things. 
And, uh, and it's a wonderful way to calm yourself, to center yourself. And also, if you don't have access to nature, if you're stuck inside because of quarantine, that doesn't mean you can't experience these feelings. You can kind of go through some of these guided imageries. So I thought it would be a fun place for us to start as we get in, to get us thinking about rain and water. If you had any thoughts or feelings or words that came to mind, throw them in the chat. Um, but I'm going to continue on by talking a bit about how we can use rainy days and rain to teach about watersheds or teach about the water cycle too. So this is not a comprehensive list. There's so many great activities out there that you can do. I just wanted to throw some on there to give you an idea of what things you could be doing. So, you know, in terms of outdoor play, even with really young kids, this is a great time to make, you know, mud muffins or soup or just do outdoor play with loose parts, you know, play where we're not, we don't have an agenda, we're just having kids go out and explore, and that's really great for their development. So playing in the mud, uh, splashing in puddles is really great. One thing, if you're into gardening, I know many of us have become gardeners during um, COVID, first time gardeners too, uh, but if you have a space, if you have access to a space, you can get a rain barrel to collect that rainwater and even have your kids or have kids that you're working with decorate that rain barrel and you can talk about, you know, why we can collect rain and how it's important for plants when we water the garden, how plants need water. So that's a fun way to, to do an art project in your garden that still connects to, to the watershed and, and the water cycle. And then if you're getting, oh, and I also, out, outdoor art, so painting with rain, you can color and take it out in the rain and it'll make cool patterns, or you can make your own natural paints with rainwater and different natural materials like flowers and things. So there's lots of art projects you can do. And then if you get more into the inquiry and action focused projects, you, know, you can start having them watch the rain. Where does water accumulate? Where does it get absorbed? Where does it flow? Paying attention to these things is really great and it gets kids to start asking questions. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Coco Rise, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and uh, Snow Network, but you can also be a citizen scientist. So you can set up a rain gauge in your backyard or on your balcony and start collecting rain and you can contribute those measurements to a national citizen science project where they're measuring precipitation across the country and contribute to science. So that's pretty cool. And then I also threw in here, this is just a lovely uh, opportunity to talk about wildlife that rely on rain or temporary wetlands. So frogs are a great one. They, li they live in what's called ephemeral wetlands. So those are temporary spaces that will evaporate and go away. So they do need that influx of rain and water. And so thinking about wildlife that particularly are connected to rain or these transient puddles and things are great and frogs are really a fun one. I know I, uh, my niece and nephew are quite young and they really like get excited when they find frogs and, and you know, you can play games and learn about frogs. So, so just some ideas as we think about the first part of the wa um, water cycle, which is precipitation. And obviously there's a whole other range you can do with snow, but I thought I'd keep it a summer focus for now. And so then if you think about the next step in the water cycle, so you go from rain to the runoff, how do we talk about runoff with kids? How do we engage our families in, in learning about um, runoff and water flow in a fun way? Well, outdoor play, a great one, and I'm sure many of you have done this, is to build and float your own boats. So you can use natural materials like sticks and bark and build boats and float them. It's a great way to get kids thinking creatively, even doing a bit of engineering and then testing buoyancy if you wanna build in curriculum links, but it could be just as simple as, as you know, throwing some different materials, natural materials in and seeing if they float and following their flow. Uh, I don't know how many, I mean, tell me in the chat, if you've played Poo Sticks, I did not know the history of this game. When I was a kid, my parents used to take me out and we would, stand on the bridge and we throw a stick in and we'd watch to see whose stick raced the fastest down the river to a certain point. And I knew it was called poo sticks and I had no idea why. So I did a little research and it turns out that's from, it was originally shared in the story Winnie the Pooh by A.A. A. Milne. And this was a game that they played in the book. So that's the origin of that, but it's a simple game. You just get sticks, you can throw them in and watch them flow and race them, which is a great way to, to talk to kids about 
how water, you know, it does flow away and where does it go? You can make those rivers and trenches in sand or dirt. I know my brother and I did that a lot when we were kids. We would build rivers and put boats on and watch them flow. And you can talk about how water moves um, and how like maybe if you built a hill, how it will change the way that things flow. So lots of great outdoor play games. And then again, if you want to get into the more inquiry and action based for maybe older groups, um, fish are a great uh, species to look at. There's so many different species of fish and you could pick maybe even some local ones. But one activity I've done a lot with um, elementary age kids is fashioning a fish, you know, making your own fish species, you know, using your imagination and creating this crazy fish species. Um, maybe it has different fins and, 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 you know, a body structure, but then turning that craft on to them and saying, okay, what adaptations does your fish have that can help it survive in its environment? So it's a way to introduce some concepts that they might be learning in early elementary around, you know, uh, their color or their shape or the shape of the mouth, you know, tells you a bit about what they eat. And so you can have them create these crazy fishes, which you can see, I said, there's a picture of this crazy blue ball. That was one of the fishes somebody made in one of the workshops we did. Um, but then have them talk to you and explain why they made the choices they did. And that's good for, you know, verbal skills as well as them telling you about their creation. Um, another one, I don't know how many of you have done a sediment jar. You just get a jar or something see-through and have kids collect dirt and soil and leaves and rocks and stones and you put it all together in a jar with water and you shake it and then you wait and you see how it settles out and you'll get to see that the heavier pieces go to the bottom and some of the lighter stuff stays near the top and it's kind of a fun tactile activity but it's a great way to show how rivers carry, you know, different things downstream and how sedimentation might be an issue where if you get too much dirt in there, it clouds up the water and that affects wildlife. So these are big concepts, right? These are pretty complicated, but you can sort of start exploring them with kids, uh, you know, in your backyard, in your house by, by doing these fun and simple activities like that. And then finally too, I think a great way to bridge um, and talk a bit about conservation is maybe doing a scavenger hunt around your house or your school and um, to identify potential sources of contamination. Because when we talk about flow, we have to remember that anything that runs off from our houses or our communities ends up in that water and gets carried away and ends up in the ocean. So with that, I have a quick little game and I encourage you all to put your thoughts in the chat, but can you tell me what are some things in our homes that could end up in rivers, lakes, and oceans? Some things maybe in different parts of your home that go down the drain, whether on purpose or maybe by accident. What are some things um, that you've noticed or that you're aware of in your homes that um, we maybe should be mindful of? I think this is a great way to, to make it tangible, you know, take kids around your house and have them start thinking about it and maybe identify. And they might notice things that, that we as parents or family members didn't notice. So one, uh, we were talking about the bathroom, you know, there's cleaners and soaps and shampoos and all of that gets washed down the drain. And um, and in many cases to filtration plants, but sometimes depending where you live and, and things that can end up um, getting in the water. Kitchens, we have cleaners and grease and food waste that goes down. Uh, our laundry rooms, we have detergents and actually microplastics and fibers from our clothes can get um, washed away down the drain too. Um, I know a lot of you know, synthetic fabrics, they just shed these really small fibers that end up going through to the ocean because they can't really be filtered very well either. So, you know, some things we're not even aware of. And our garage, you know, if we're washing our car in the driveway, all that water ends up in the storm drain. And the storm drains don't always end up going through water filtration. They go out to holding ponds. So if you're going to wash your car, it's actually better to go to the car wash because they have proper um, collection where they can filter the water before it goes out into the water bodies. But, you know, being mindful of that, as well as how we dispose of things like paint and, and different chemicals, make sure we're doing that correctly. And of course our yards, you know, fertilizers and any pet droppings, even exposed soil can put dirt into the water. So 
this is just to give you some ideas as if you decide to do a bit of a scavenger at, a hunt at home with your family or in your school or in your community to keep an eye open because when we identify things then we can come up with ideas to, to fix it or try to mitigate it there's a lot of great resources out there perfect so we did the flowing down um, runoff then really all that runoff gets into our rivers and streams and makes its way to the ocean. So I wanted to do a quick activity and see how many pieces of ocean debris you can spot. I know it might be small screen for some of you if you're on a tablet or a phone, but if you can put your best guess in the chat of how many pieces of ocean debris you can see, um, I wanna see uh, if you notice all of the different things that could, can end up washing from our rivers and streams down out to the ocean. I see someone's guess nine. That's great. Any other guesses? I've hidden some good ones. Some is really small. 11, 10. Good guesses. Some are a little bit more obvious. Some are very small. I think of those microplastics. 15. I see 15. That's a good guess too. So we have quite a range. I'm from nine to 15. There's actually 17 in the picture because I also included natural debris, um, which isn't as harmful in many cases, but sometimes things like big logs and things get washed out. So you can see here, we've got bottle caps and uh, cups and straws in, the, wa in the, uh, the grass, water bottles, plastic bags, candy wrappers and things. So this is just something I often do with kids uh, just to get their sense, because we all see the big things, right? But often it's really small pieces of microplastic and things that end up in our waterways and flow. And, and the, most of the, st the garbage that and the pollutants that end up in the ocean, I think it's 80% comes from land. So it's, you know, we might not live right on the ocean, but we're all connected to the ocean through our watershed. And I just wanted to include this slide because this is the 2020 uh, report from the shoreline cleanup, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, which you can get involved in going out and cleaning up a shoreline near you. But these are the top 12, they call them the dirty dozen of things that they find. So you can see cigarette butts, tiny plastic and foam, food wrappers, paper, bottle caps, beverage cans, plastic bottles. And some of those are recyclable, right? Packaging, coffee cups, straws, um, I think we're probably now in the pandemic finding more and more masks too. We find a lot of masks and these things can become a problem because, you know, a plastic bag might look like a jellyfish, which is what sea turtles eat. Or, you know, those rings that go around pop cans can, uh, there's lots of documented cases of them getting uh, caught up on wildlife and, you know, getting entangled. So these are the things that we have to be aware of because a lot of them are coming down our watershed and into the ocean. So it's not just an issue for people who live on the ocean, it's for everybody who's in the watershed, which is all of us. So here are some I thoughts about activities from for thinking about rivers to oceans. So things you can do on the shoreline, you know, if we're thinking about um, all of these things that flow down into the water. And some are just outdoor play. Again, you know, really young kids, it's about getting them outside and exposing them to new ideas. So you could uh, just take them out to a shoreline or if you're on the ocean and you have access to tide pools, walk around, explore and see what you find. I know how many kids just do that naturally, go out and think, look at this rock. And uh, I was that kid, I had like a basket of things. I was like, look at all these things. But what I would encourage you as somebody who works for a conservation organization is to take pictures or draw items in a nature journal rather than taking them home. Because obviously a lot of those pieces, um, not including plastics, if you're cleaning up, please do take those things, excuse me. But uh, you know, seashells and logs and rocks and things, uh, they're part of the ecosystem. So it's great to leave them where they are, especially wildlife if there's sea stars or anything. But um, you know, you can draw them in a nature journal or take pictures uh, instead of taking them home. And obviously, you know, taking a rock or two home isn't going to be a problem. But if you know you're taking lots of that home, then it's not going to be part of that ecosystem anymore. So just something to think about, so we can make sure we're doing responsible recreation. But some things can be simple too, as building a sandcastle or a fort, you know, going out and experiencing these seaside or shoreline places. 
drawing in the sand is a really fun one too. I mean, you can do all kinds of fun things. And then as if for older kids or kids who, you know, are getting into school, uh, you can do more complicated activities like mapping your shoreline, getting maybe some graph paper and a clipboard, you know, which is fun because it feels like, you know, you're a scientist or something and going out and drawing the shoreline and maybe mapping some of the natural features like trees and inlets or rock features, but also including human features. And then you can use that as a, a source for conversation. Um, you know, it can become a treasure map for a game later. You can, you know, use that map, but it's a nice way to sneak some skill building in, into, you know, some of the play activities as well. Uh, another one of my favorites, which there's, you can't really see super well, but there's a picture uh, you can kind of see here and they've drawn a blue whale to scale. So this is something really fun you can do to help kids imagine wildlife that they probably won't see in person in their lifetime unless they're very lucky. And so you can take it, so you can have them draw an actual, you know, accurate picture on graphing paper and then use that to scale up. And we like, you know, recommend going on your driveway or somewhere where you've got a nice piece of pavement and using sidewalk chalk. And then you can draw a grid and then draw in the different parts of the drawing or have a group of kids draw in at each apart. And then you have your small scale drawing and you have your actual to scale drawing. And with some of these, I think kids are blown away by how big the wildlife are. You know, like a blue whale is huge. Uh, and we can't really fathom that, but you could do it with any species, you different whale species or, you know, even fish and things, some fish. I don't think many people who who haven't you know experienced these wildlife would know you know we get tuna in a can that's like this big and it's flaked but tuna are huge fish so you know we don't always connect the dots with some of the food we eat or some of the animals that we're familiar with so so a great way to make it tangible by having them draw it on on the ground and say this is how big it is actually and maybe comparing it to things uh and of course there's lots of you know, restoration work you can do. I mean, Watersheds Canada, there's lots of water restoration work. Trout Unlimited is great. Uh, there's lots of land trusts as well, where you can volunteer to go out and help plant trees. Or if you have a shoreline property, you know, look at your shoreline and think, okay, how can we bring back some of the natural habitat along our shoreline by planting willow or, or native shrubs and plants? And you can get kids involved in that because they're really good. They've got lots of energy. And, and, you know, it's a great way to learn through experience. And then finally, I can't go without saying, join a shoreline cleanup. You know, they do these big pushes throughout the year. A lot of school groups will go or girl guide groups. Uh, families will go. I think it's especially great during COVID when you're, you kind of have to hang out with your cohort, but you could sign up to go and join a shoreline cleanup and pick a local shoreline and help clean up the garbage or even just plan to conduct your own so that when you're out you know, at the beach or on the shoreline and you see these things, um, making sure to be safe, of course, when you're picking them up and wear gloves if appropriate, but you know, not leaving these plastics and things on the shoreline. If we see them, let's pick them up and dispose of them properly. So lots we can do just to, for exploration and play, but then also, of course, to connect them to, you know, more inquiry-based thinking and getting them involved in conservation action, because you don't need to be an adult to have an impact on water conservation. In fact, I would say young people are some of the most influential because they, they remember things and they become these amazing ambassadors. So whether we're talking about, you know, precipitation and rain to runoff to shoreline activities, there's like this very broad scope of things you can do to get your families and kids involved um, in learning about their watershed in a way that's tangible to them. So I do want to highlight one more game. I really wish that we were all in person and I could run this game with you because it's much more fun to play than to, to talk about. But Hopefully we'll be able to share these slides with you, but I'll kind of give you an idea. If you have a group of kids, there's also some really fun games you can play that are educational games, um, but they don't have to know they're educational. <laughs> uh, one of them that we have at CWF is called a clean getaway. So if you have a group of kids, you can split them into two teams. One team gets to be the water champions and their job is to jointly carry these buckets of water 
down a pathway to the ocean. So they're carrying clean water to the ocean. In the meantime, the second team is human hazards. And they're trying to contaminate these water buckets by throwing sponges, trying to land them into these water buckets. So when you set up the course, you generally want to, I don't know, with rope or something, you determine where the course is, where the start point is, um, you know, maybe from your home, and then where the end point is, which is the ocean. And your team of water champions has to carry the bucket on ropes all the way down to the end. And in the meantime, if you had hula hoops or designated spots um, for the human hazards, they stand there and they have sponges and they're trying to throw these in and those represent contaminants. So you can also um, put obstacles in the way, like they have to maybe climb over things together while holding the water, but whether it's a bench or maybe they have to go under a table or, or something. And then you can also have a little safe zone. So maybe it's a really long way. They can have parts where they can pause. So if they get to those spots with nothing in their bucket, maybe they can shorten the ropes up, making it easier for them to carry the buckets. And if they get to those spots and they have sponges in their buckets, they have to have longer ropes, which makes it harder to carry. So what you do is you can give them like three minutes or however long to keep the game moving, but you time them and see how many buckets they can, of water they can get safely uh, from their start point to the ocean without getting contaminants. And you can count the contaminants that they get. And then at the end, you can switch and then the human hazards get to become the champions and the champions become the hazards. And so they get a try at that. So it's kind of a fun way. It's like an obstacle course, but the goal and, is to get that clean water to the ocean. And I think the lesson is that in that is that as it goes along the way, there's lots of contaminants that can you know, get in our water source. And you can even maybe label them or talk about them, the different types and link it back to what we were saying about, you know, things in our house that we have to be careful of. But it's a fun, active game that kids can play and then learn a bit about how water flows through a watershed to the ocean and what can happen along the way. So I hope you, if you have a group of kids or even your family, if you've got enough people to play this game, I would encourage it. It's super fun to do in person. Um, it's really active and it can be as hard or as difficult as you want uh, for older kids. I just add more obstacles because then they have to climb over without spilling things. So with that, our time has flown. You've made it. You completed our journey through our watershed. Um, and I remember we said at the beginning that I wanted you to imagine that you were a drop of water, uh, but really we're all part of the watershed, right? And our bodies are made up of water and we need water for our own health. So not only just for the health of the environment and plants and wildlife, but it's also really important for us. So I wanna throw another question at you because I'm being mean and I'm asking you skill questions, but how much of our body do you think is made up of water? So the human body, and it's actually a bit different depending on whether you are a, adult male or female or a kid, but I want you to throw your best guess in the chat to how much of our bodies you think is made up of water. So obviously tiny drops of water, we're actually made up of those. So it might be more than you think. I see 70%, 65 to 70%. Yeah, perfect guesses, you're right on. It's up to 60% for adults, slightly less I guess for female adults, but around 60% of our bodies is water. And then for kids, it's actually 65 to 75%. So there, there's a, even a bit more water in them just proportionally. So the lesson being in that, and I just have this little graphic here, is like, what does water do for us? Because let's bring all of this big concept stuff back to ourselves and make it relevant. Well, it's important um, for our brain. It helps us regulate our body temperature. It keeps all of our joints um, you know, lubricated. It's important for our body cells. Uh, our blood transports, you know, a lot and it's made up of water. So nutrients uh, as well as oxygen is transported through our body. Uh, it helps us filter out toxins. Uh, you know, it's just, there's so much. So when we think about water and, you know, we started thinking about watersheds from an outside perspective and a large scale perspective, it's also really great to bring it close to us and remember that we live in the watershed, we're part of it, 
we need it just as much as any other wildlife. So we are also responsible for taking care of it. I have a glass of water right here on my table. So, you know, it's such an important thing for humans. So with that, I know we're kind of getting to the end here. I just wanted to share some tips for continuing your outdoor exploration because I really am so thankful that you joined us today, but this is just the beginning. Like, what can you do? What can you take home and do? And this is just a sampling. I mean, there's tons of tips available, but you know, think about what to wear, you know, as you're going out exploring, it's really important to think about, okay, do I have weather appropriate clothes for the sun or for the rain protection? And I even like with young kids and maybe even not so young kids, but to even have adventure themed clothes. You know, I bought my nephew a little vest that he can wear when he goes adventuring, maybe put on a fun hat. If you're going on an exploration, you should dress the part and make sure you have appropriate activity, appropriate footwear. So if you're at the beach and you're in sandals, that's great. But if you're going to be on a rocky surface or a slippery surface, you know, remember those good grips on the shoes. Um, what do you bring? Well, it depends on the activity you're doing, but um, I really, really encourage you to get kids involved in packing. We, on our website, we have things like how to pack a star bag for stargazing or how to create a backpack full of things. And I know that Monica will talk a bit about this later because they have some really great resources, but what can you put in the backpack that is not just practical, but inspiring? So, you know, you might need water, snacks and not just a little bit like I know in some cases if you're going really far you might need like a liter of water and you might need a lot of snacks because kids get hangry and adults get hangry too actually <laughs> but bring those things and maybe make them theme like maybe goldfish crackers if you're going to talk about fish I mean these things seem very simple but this is the stuff that gets kids excited and engaged um, you can bring materials, so books and nature journals, pens and paper and art supplies, and, or you can use found bits. Like if you go out, you can find pine cones and leaves and use those materials. Uh, if you have the availability um, you, or access to them, you can bring equipment. So you can bring binoculars or lawn chairs. Uh, that's a barrier for a lot of people, but I would say that you don't need to have equipment or expensive equipment. Uh, binoculars are wonderful, but if you don't have them, you can get a couple pieces of toilet paper roll and decorate them and make yourself a set of binoculars. And I know you're thinking, okay, well, these don't magnify, and that is very true, but actually they're really good for young kids because it helps them to focus on a certain field of vision. So they can just look here and it gets them to pay attention to specific things. So before you get them wielding those big uh, binoculars like just make a pair of these and decorate them it becomes a craft project and then they can draw what they see in their field of vision I'm, I'm a huge fan of nature notebooks you can make them out of paper and crafts I've made my own little notebooks out of scrap paper or recycled paper or old cereal boxes and they can decorate them and keep track of their observations uh, you know, first, obviously safety, first aid kit, bug spray, sunscreen, those are all really important and safety, right? And when we go out and do things outside, just maybe do a bit of research or have a think about where you're going and what you're doing. Are you near close to home? Are you in your backyard? Are you going to the, to the park? And, you know, how accessible is it? Can you take your stroller or, you know, is it going to be an off-roading situation? Are there any wildlife you might encounter and how can we make sure that we're, we're being respectful of the wildlife and not you know, disturbing them? And share your plans with your family members or friends. I think it's so important as somebody who's done uh, field leader training, like you drill this into your head, you know, make sure you tell people where you're going and what you're up to so that they can look out for you. That's just really good. Uh, and remember to the leave no traces principles. So if you bring in garbage, make sure to take it back with you. We don't want that to end up in our watershed. So just good practices to teach to when you're really young, right? When we bring all our picnic out, we make sure we collect everything that we, you know, gather up all our little pieces and take it home. I think there's a really fun video clip from the show Mad Men in the 60s where the family went for a picnic and they were done and they immediately just shook the picnic blanket out and all the garbage flew and then they just walked away. <laughs> That's not great. Let's, yeah, let's try to be responsible and take all our pieces home so they don't end up in the ocean, right? Um, so suffice to say, this is just touching the surface, but I wanted to highlight that the Canadian Wildlife Federation actually has a Wild Family Nature Club, and we've created a bunch of different activity ideas you can do, and we've listed all of that stuff out in detail of like, what would you need? What are some tips? 
for going with different age groups. Um, what's a tip for doing, if you can't go to the beach, how do you do that in your backyard? Maybe by having a sandbox or something and giving you ideas and resources um, so you know what you're doing. You can have some activity examples. You know what safety things to think about. So I really encourage those of you who are interested to check out our Wild Family Nature Club. It's a great resource for those who are just looking for ideas and, and tips to get kids outside and, and get them engaged. And then, of course, I have to just put in a plug for all of our other education programs. I'm part of a very large education team. We're really fortunate to have programs that connect all different age groups to nature. So our Family Nature Club, which is about families with young kids. We have a Wild Spaces program, which is about um, uh, conservation and pollinator conservation and gardening in schools. So it's curriculum based resources for schools and how to how to have a pollinator friendly garden in your school. Our webinar program where we, we do it both with the public and with kids in schools to bring experts into the classroom and connect people with some of the cool things going on um, with conservation. Our wild outside program which is for teenagers 15 to 18 years old that gets them outside to, to um, you know, connect with other people, do community projects and conservation work, but also just outdoor recreation. And then our Canadian Conservation Corps is for 18 to 30 year olds, and we partner with Outward Bound, and they take them on a nature expedition for a week, and then they do, it's a whole, it's a nine month program. They do a, a stage two placement with a community organization doing volunteer work, and they do a community project. So it's really a leadership program for that age group of 18 to 30 year olds. And finally, our wild education program, where we work with teachers and educators and parents to provide free curriculum-based resources, activity sets, lesson plans, posters, you name it. We have a whole online learning library with free resources with, you know, like I said, projects and lessons and, and coloring sheets and all of that, and that's available to you as well. So I really encourage you to check out our website or check out us on social media because this is the stuff that we love, we want to get it in your hands so that you can use it with your families. So, oh, and one last thing, I guess I know we mentioned it's Rivers to Oceans Week this week. Uh, CWF celebrates from June 8th to June 14th. June 8th is World Oceans Day and June 14th is Canadian Rivers Day. So we celebrate all week. If you're interested in ideas, we've created this free bingo sheet, uh, which is in the resource sheet that Monica will share with everyone just gives you some fun, easy activities you can do. And we really do encourage you to just mark, you know, print off a copy, stick it on your fridge, or use the markup on your phone to cross off things as you do them. Maybe take pictures and tag us so that we can see you doing this stuff in your neighborhood and share it with us because sometimes we just need, you know, some inspiration. And you can tell some of the things on here are pretty simple. Like, do, did you do water themed arts and crafts? You can become a citizen scientist, learn about aquatic wildlife, trace your, your, the route that water travels from you to the ocean. So tons of things. I think there's even one on here. Yeah, wear, wear water-themed clothing. So a whole variety of activities to inspire you and your families to, to celebrate Rivers to Oceans Week. So with that, I guess I'll throw it back to you, Monica, um, and see maybe if we have any questions. Um, before we do that, actually, I'm just going to quickly. Oh, yes. Um, Tell us about, about the backpacks. Mm -hmm. um, so just bear with me one second. Um, so as I mentioned in the poster, we do have a few uh, different programs that are launching for Watersheds Canada this summer. So we have two that are happening in the Ontario two places in Ontario, Halliburton and then Perth. So before you say, oh, Monica, I don't live in those areas, um, don't worry. Some of the resources are going to be available online. And then some of them are also going to be piloted and ideally uh, launched in different areas. So stick with me. Um, the first one is for youth living in the Halliburton and Peterborough areas. So we are going to be developing two types of kits, one forest themed and one freshwater themed. 
And these are free kits. So as Kaylee mentioned, some of the barriers for getting outside might be equipment. So these resources are free activity guides and free field equipment so that youth can kind of get more familiar with natural areas around them and the species that live there, what role they play in the environment and how they can help them. So this project is uh, delivered in partnership with Watersheds Canada, the Land Between Charity, the Halliburton Highlands Outdoor Association, Outdoors for Youth Club and Water Rangers. And the funding is from the Arthur and Audrey Cutton Foundation. So these are what the kits look like. So like I said, we, we know that not everyone likes being by the water or is even near water and some people don't like the forest. So uh, the youth have a choice. We've put kind of the, the basics, the introduction, and then given them each an action step. So for the forest kit, we're looking at birds and pollinators, how they're actually a lot more similar than people might think, and how people can take action to help them on their own property. So no matter if you live in an apartment, you live right on the water, you're in the middle of the city, you can still help these species. Then our freshwater kit, um, we're looking at kind of pond dipping. So getting youth uh, not afraid of frogs or other slimy things. We want them to get familiar with those species. Also learn about water quality using a water ranger's test kit. How these different factors in the water, we kind of just look at it like it's this uniform thing. And there are actually lots of different things going on under the water. So just trying to expose them to different uh, like pH and clarity those sort of things. And then for both of these kits, encouraging them to take local action and also participate in citizen science programs. We also have a program launching in Perth. So this is the first year pilot. And so we're having a nature discovery backpack lending library. So again, this is targeted at youth. And the reason these two projects are targeted at youth is because we felt like this is where they start deciding their interests. Do they want to stick with going out for hikes with the family? Do they want to stick with going and looking for animals on their own or with their friends? And we want to encourage them through that transition period. So this lending library will be launching in Perth and it's thanks to uh, Peterborough KM Hunter Charitable Foundation and TD Friends of the Environment. And it's being delivered actually with Yaku Services and Friends of the Tay Watershed. So, uh, and water rangers. So the backpacks are going to have a number of different resources in them. A lot of what we've talked about today actually. So different guides, um, writing things down in notebooks, having little collection jars, binoculars, and again the water test kit. And we're really excited about this program because we want it to grow. We want it to spread. So we're starting this year in Perth, just trying to fine tune other things that people might want in a backpack and so if you're in a school or a community group that is not Perth I would really encourage you to send me an email after this webinar or later this week if you need to talk to a principal or something like that because we would really love to get these backpacks in the hands of youth. Um, it is free, accessible, and also very uh, picture based. So it's uh, not too scientific. We've tried to make it accessible for maybe ESL students or people that have just never spent a lot of time outdoors who want it to be accessible for them. So um, we've also created a checklist. So if you don't live in Perth and you'd like to get outside this summer right away, we have a checklist on our website on the Freshwater Stewardship Community page. And it just outlines a lot of the same thing that Kaylee has talked about, just different ways to look for wildlife, look at them up close in a safe way if that's possible, learn about what's going on in the soil, what's going on with the local wildlife, how does it change from season to season, um, and also participating in shoreline and forest cleanups. Um, so if we're spending more time out in nature, what belongs there, what doesn't? Um, and also some information on tick safety if you are going in the forest. So I would encourage you to check out our website or to send me an email. And uh, I'm just gonna share, I think, one more thing. Oh, no, two more things. Uh, the handout that Kaylee mentioned, all of the different resources we've talked about today, you will get a copy of this. All the hyperlinks are embedded. It's also really easy to share with other people who maybe haven't attended live, or if you have other teachers or educators, parents who'd like to share it with, 
all the information is on this and it's also on our website. And then the last one is just the next uh, webinar in our freshwater stewardship community series, which is going to be about the importance of wetland plants for dragonflies and damselflies. So I think these are one of those species that we just kind of see, we associate them with being by the water, but we don't think maybe how important plants are to their life cycle. So this webinar will be talking a bit about identifying these different uh, species, but then also how we can take individual steps to help their populations. So with that, uh, we have a few minutes for questions and answers. I'm just gonna pop some information in the chat. Um, so Kaylee and I's emails, if you have any questions, you missed a resource, anything like that. Um, we also have the link for the next webinar. And then finally, uh, if you could take a few minutes, we have an evaluation survey. So you can just let us know what you thought of the webinar today. Is it what you thought it was going to be? Is there something you wish we had covered? And we can always follow up with you. But I will uh, just leave it open for a few minutes if anyone has any questions or comments for Kaylee or myself. Thank you all so much for, for sticking with us. I know this after a year of being uh, online and doing online stuff, it's always uh, a challenge to do a full webinar, but thank you all so much for joining. And I see, so I saw some thank yous in the chat. So I just wanted to make sure I said it as well. It's, it's really fun to be able to be here to talk to you about all these, these activities. Yes, and um, yes, also thank you everyone for joining us for Rivers to Oceans Week, and you still have a couple more days to celebrate the official week, but of course you can keep doing these activities all year long. And anything that we've mentioned that you maybe missed or didn't write down in time, we will be sharing all the resources with you afterwards, as well as a recording of this webinar. So thank you all so much for coming and have a good evening. Bye everyone. Take care.